Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, April 10, 2014, and this is the Weekend Charts. I know I say it every week, but this week, especially given current market conditions, I seriously really mean it. i got a lot to cover, so I'm going to get a little jacked up on some Mountain Dew. My wife has replenished my dew supply, so I hope you uh, hope you ate your weeds today if you plan on keeping up, because I talk really fast and cover a lot of stuff. Oh, good stuff. Making some Mountain Dew do not compensate me. But hey, PepsiCo, you're out there. I'm looking for a sponsor. It's been a while since we shorted Monster. Maybe Monster will pick me up. I actually had one yesterday. Um, I think it tastes so bad that that's what keeps you up. <laughs> it's the bad taste more than the, the chemicals that they put in there. Anyway, enough of that nonsense. I digress. Hey, there's a disclaimer screed. Let me sum it up for you. All predictions are about the future. A lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Oh, by the way, oh, where's my stuff screen? Oh, we missed the screen. Hey, do me a favor. If you read my book, which I assume you have, otherwise I'm not sure why you'd be here. And if you like my book, then uh, throw me a bone. Put me up a review on Amazon. Um, overwhelmingly, the reviews are positive, but every now and then you get somebody who's malignant who puts something stupid up that has nothing to do with the book. So it helps to balance things out, even if you agree with everyone else. So uh, this is the part of the show where I beg for a review, and if you give me one, I will give you a high five. Uh, what are we going to talk about? Well, yesterday I did, uh, or day before, I forget, I think it was day before, Tuesday, um, I talked about widening the stop to stay with longer-term winners, and as you know, recently we did this uh, Trader to Trend Follower webinar, and there's a couple things that came out of Tuesday's webinar that I want to kind of bring up again and, and one thing is the widening of the stop to stay with longer term positions I thought everybody do that it's kind of like the the Geico commercial it's like well did you know that Pinocchio Pinocchio was a bad motivational speaker you know I see potential in you and you and you and it's you know in all of you um, but I thought everybody do that you widen the stop to make that transition and as I said before um, I was in a seminar in Italy, and my translator was Emilio Tomasini, and he's a trader. You can Google him. Um, and he actually stopped me to uh, because he was fascinated with this concept. And then I was on a project about a year later, and the same kind of similar thing kind of happened. It was like, hey, you, what Dave's doing is pretty cool. So I thought everybody do this, but now I'm beginning to believe that not everybody does. So I want to recap a few things that came out. Uh, yesterday's or Tuesday's webinar because I, I went into a lot more detail and uh, check back with me I think the recordings to that will be ready next week it was for the festival of traders I want to touch upon the fact that uh, shorting uh, can be a real pain but I'm gonna make a case for it being a necessary evil and that'll make more sense in just one second and then finally I want to talk about portfolio ebb and flow now you guys have seen this graphic quite a bit so we're gonna kinda rush through this but when you're a short-term trader, your gains are limited because you're in the market for a short time, and your losses are also somewhat limited because you're in the market for a long time. But even as a short-term trader, you can still get in a lot of trouble. So th this is why I think if you were just a short-term trader in and of itself, you still have some major issues to face. And a lot of bad things could happen. Let's say you're a day trader, and the most you ever make is – somebody emailed me recently and said, um, I'm day trading, and when I make a dollar, I quit. It's like, okay, that's fine. But what happens if you're long a stock or maybe even short a stock? It doesn't matter. And let's say they halt that stock intraday, and the next, the next open is $20 higher, okay? Well, now it's going to take you 20 trades to make up for that $20 loss, okay? Now, that's a bit of an extreme example, but as you can see, by limiting your profits as a short-term trader, sooner or later you're going to get in trouble. Now, not that you won't get in trouble with my stuff, because I can guarantee you will, okay? At the opposite of the extreme, if you're a trend follower, your drawdowns are going to be abysmal, and your accuracy is going to be very low. So what I'm thinking is... And what I've been doing is take a hybrid approach for the last 20 years where you trade for a short-term gain and you hang around for a long-term gain. Now, I know most of you know this, 
so I'm going to go fairly quickly. But there's only a, there's a couple things I want to flesh out. And what amazes me too is the more I do this, um, there's still a few concepts or a few uh, questions that do come up from this. But again, this is um, switching from trader to trade follower. This is NG. This was a little gold stock. It broke out, pulls back. It probably had a bow tie and some other stuff that occurred back here off of multi-year lows. And it rallies up. And we'll take a look at the spreadsheet. I forget exactly where. But somewhere in here, we took partial profits. And then so far, so good, although it's, it's about right here now. It's come back in a little bit. And that's consolidated. So we're hoping that this thing is going to go a long, long ways. Now, I hate to use the word hope. Well, we don't know. So we follow it up with a protective stop. Now, the secret, if there is a secret, is you let that stop widen out from the swing trade position, okay, to where, let's say, it comes back to this base and you would be wrong. Or you're looking at the volatility of the stock and say, okay, well, it's moved uh, this far over a few days, so my stop better be a little bit bigger than that to hopefully ride out the short-term volatility, which comes with resumption of the swing trade, okay, to a, hopefully a swing trade profit. And then as things began to materialize, we began to open that stop up significantly to hopefully ride out some longer-term corrections. If we have the mother of all bottoms in this stock, NG, Nova Gold, then it's probably not going to be a straight line higher. At least it hasn't been so far, especially if it's something like gold. There's going to be some uh, fits and starts, some consolidation, some fairly significant corrections along the way. Uh, this is my, one of my favorite examples from last year. This was CLDX. It had set up this beautiful um, TKO type of setup. Initially, the first day it took off, so we initially raised our stop. But then it just kind of meandered around, became so-called dead money. But then look what happened. It began to rally nicely. We get our stop up, oh, I think close to break even on this one. Comes back in, meanders again. And notice that our stop ends up below the subsequent basis. So when you start off, you wait out here. And as it bases, the stop keeps climbing higher to each subsequent base. And this is kind of like the Darvis box theory, okay? Stock makes a box, and then it moves into a slightly higher box, and then it kind of moves into another box. And each time it does, your stop goes up. Actually, each time it hits new highs, your stock goes up. But you increase it by a diminishing amount. And that I'll show you that in just one second. Uh, this came up last week, and it was kind of a surprising question, but... Um, I guess it makes a lot of sense because I, I, I guess I wasn't explaining it properly. I kept saying, widen your stops, widen your stops, widen your stops. So what I'm talking about is widening your stops naturally. So by naturally, I mean increase them at a deceleration rate, decelerating rate. So as the stop begins to accelerate higher, we trail our stop higher but by not quite as much. When you first start off as a trader, as a swing trader, looking to capture short-term move, you're pretty much on a one-for-one -one basis. And then you guys who've been in the service in more recent times, I've been a little bit more lenient with that, and I've opened up those stops just a little bit on that first loaf. But in general, I'm still tracking it fairly close. Once things begin to open up, I let them open up naturally. And by naturally... I mean that, let's say a stock goes up a little bit. Well, some days I might not do anything, okay? And then that stop widens by that amount, which I'll show you in one second. And let's say the stock begins to trend nicely higher, begins to accelerate higher. Well, I'm going to tra trail my stop higher, but at a bit of a decelerating rate, so this begins to open up. So the stop is from here to here, and now it's from here to here. And maybe it's better drawn on an angle. Let's say it's from here. To here, okay. So notice that this sideways V, if you want to call it that, begins begins to get much bigger. We don't ever lower our stop on long. So when I say widen, that doesn't mean as this goes up, this goes down, okay. Or if this goes sideways, this goes down. This will never go down. This can only go up, okay. Meaning that you never drop your stop. Unless you're doing some discretionary things, you pull your stop, let things happen, and then put your stop back in. But that's another that's another lesson, okay? Now, just real quick, because a lot of people, um, a lot of people have um, 
ask me this. Oh, the question is, did you add the position? No, I didn't add to this one because it really didn't set up. It really didn't set up that well. See, right here, it pulled back into the prior uh, pullback. So this was one that was just written out. Okay. Um, now, let me just show you this real quick. I know you guys have seen this a thousand times. But let me just show you one more time because I'm amazed at the amount of people that have trouble staying with winners. I've got one big winner in the portfolio, my personal portfolio at least, that's been in there forever, and I just let it go, okay? Like the like the Frozen song, you know, let it go. <laughs> and I don't care because it's, it's way up here, and I got it way down there, and it's going to ride out some corrections along the way. And for me, it's like a game. How long can I hold on? Now, obviously, you want to, if that stop gets hit, then it gets hit and you get out, but for me, if you make things kind of like a game, it makes it a little easier. And I'll show you a little trick uh, that, that's kind of like gamish in nature in just one second. But the point, the reason I show this chart is at this particular point, you were up closing in on 50% on the position. But then look what happens. It comes in and it has a pretty serious correction. Then you're only up 25%, okay? And then it takes off. Then you're up 100%. So my point is if you quit at 25% or 50% or 44%, whatever the case may be, or 100%, you're never going to get 200%, okay? Now, this did stop out down here at about 150%, as you'll see in one second, or 152, I think, if memory serves. So this turned out to be the top, but how did, how did I know this was a top? I didn't. I had to stop right here, giving it plenty enough room, just in case it corrected, and then it was off to the race. So, well, right about that time, I think the market kind of got a little iffy. Uh, sector kind of corrected itself, and, and we got knocked out. And this stock now is trading much lower. I haven't checked it lately. Um, if somebody wants to pull it up, I'm sure it's much lower than where it was. Um, I was a little reluctant to put this in here because I, I often talk quite a bit about not monetizing profits. And, and, and these it's kind of talking out of both sides of my mouth when I say this. Okay, um, By not monetizing profits, what I'm saying is when you are 100, up 100% on the trade, whatever that number comes to, you can't say, well, I could I could buy a car with that amount of money. And you start thinking of all the wonderful things you could do with that money. <laughs> Maybe not a great car. depends on the size of your account. But a car, nonetheless. And you start to monetize it into maybe uh, 10 mortgage payments or 20 mortgage payments or you know, whatever, two years' worth of mortgage payments or whatever the case may be. You monetize it into something, okay? And if you're a trend follower, that's a really bad thing to do because you're going to want to take those profits. And as I kind of alluded to earlier, you really have to set yourself up for unlimited gains because sooner or later something bad will happen to you, either, either over a short period of time directly or, either, or possibly serially over a period of time, let's say the market starts getting choppy, you start getting chopped out, you start uh, stopped out, you start giving up some of these open profits, you start getting stopped out on positions that just never did materialize, so you got an outright loss. So all these things can happen, and trust me, will happen in time, okay? So you can't quit, and you can't monetize those open profits, but Sometimes you have to widen to a point where it begins to hurt. So the stock begins to rally up, and then you keep you play your games or however you do it to where your stop rises at a little bit slower rate. And at some point you're like, "Holy moly, that is a pretty big stop. If I get stopped out, that's gonna that's gonna hurt." But as I'm going to show you here in one minute, you have to really look at things on a net net basis. If you got it here, and this is 150 percent, wow especially like in the case of CLDX, where it's a little bit over half a year. So let's just round the, round the numbers out. That's a 300% return annualized, okay? You just get a few of those in your portfolio, and your whole year uh, is made. Now, why do we get to where it begins to hurt? It means that you're going to get an increase in volatility, as you, you're going to see real quick, especially if you do things properly. If you pick the best stocks to begin with, you're going to get an expansion in volatility and an acceleration in trend, which I'm going to show you in one second. So you're going to have to widen that stop out to ride out some corrections. Now, that CLDX, unfortunately, stopped out at 150. Hey, you know what? Better than the poke of the eye. I'm, I'm happy with that. Okay, But let's say that it did have a massive correction and then it went on to go up 600% or 800%. Okay, 
And then I've got the mother of all trends underway, and then I'm trailing up higher. And even if I do get stopped out, it's so much money, who cares, okay? But you have to be willing to give up some of those open profits, and that's why every now and then you'll see me show, uh, I've done this similar chart over and over. In fact, if you look at my... Um, if you look at my old presentation graphics, I must have a dozen or more of these charts that look just like this. But it just so happens that CLDX was the last one that really made a really good example. Okay. The other thing you need to ask yourself is, as that stop widens out, where would I be wrong, really wrong? Okay. So in this particular case, and we'll come back to the actual, I think it was the stop was about right here. If this stock drops to 27 it looks like it's on its way back to this prior little base in here. And at that point in time, you're probably wrong. I mean, you never know for sure, but you're probably wrong. When you start into the trade and as things begin to rally up, let's say you're up 25%, well, you know it probably shouldn't come below this base in here, okay? And then once it begins to rally a little bit, maybe this base here would be a spot where you would really be wrong. It would no longer be a trend. Let's say it came down to here. Well, from here to here, that's no longer a trend. So, hey, you're wrong at that point, point in time. That's not to say that you should stay with the stock, should exit a stock when it begins to base. It loses momentum because maybe it's just building up steam for the next leg higher. But what I am saying is that if it is above that base, it should not drop below that base by a significant amount, okay? And so maybe that's a good place for your stop, which you're going to allow to widen naturally, again, and it's going to end up below those bases. So, again, if you do it properly, you're going to find the stop will often end up below bases, okay? And then, once again, better to love, have loved and lost, okay? Look at what you made on a net-net basis than to never have loved at all. Like I said last week and week before and often, uh, Curtis Facebook, the where did it go? Not the where did it go, uh, the way of the turtle, I think. It's on my website under books, more books you should read. Definitely read that book. It's entertaining and educational, and I don't have it handy. I don't know what I did with it. It's somewhere here in my bookcase. I can't find it, but I'm pretty sure it's The Way of the Turtle by Curtis Faith. And uh, he said that uh, Dennis and Eckhart, I think it was Eckhart, uh, said that they take um, they, The Way of the Turtle is the name of the book. And they treated open profits differently, drawdowns to open profits differently than drawdowns created by losses. So I guess they were more inclined to cut the losses short than to than to exit when you had losses to open profits. And I like the way I like their way of thinking. Yeah, it, it's gonna suck when it ends, okay? But if it ends and you make 153% over let's say six or eight months, okay, man, that's a lot of money. You really did well. Okay. You need a couple of these a year and you need to control everything else, make a little, lose a little, make a little, lose a little, and you'll do just fine. Now, the concept I was saying earlier, notice that your stops, your trailing stops kind of end up below the bases. Kind of, that's kind of like a natural phenomenon of letting them widen out. And see, you let it widen out to this point here, and notice that you were able to ride out this correction. It doesn't always happen. Sometimes it'll come down. It'll kiss that little stop. Remember SPWR, I wasn't going to bring it up today, but it, there it is. Uh, I did it. Uh, and then it turns around and goes right back up. Okay, But the idea is to give it plenty enough room so you can ride out these sideways corrections and maybe even a correction lower before hopefully it takes off again. In this particular case, it finally did take off, and then you get stopped out. Now somebody will say, Gabe, why not use a parabolic stop? It would have got you out right here. Well, if you use a parabolic stop, it probably would have got you out right here, and you'd have to have made that much, or it might even got you out right here. So people tend to look at look at the end, the final result, and then figure out a way to improve on that with the benefit of hindsight. Okay, so I'm okay with. I mean, if you want to use a parabolic stop on something, that's fine. The parabolic, if you, uh, I don't think you have an IntelliChart, but if you have Metastock, a parabolic SAR is a, um, I think it stands for stop and reverse, but I would never trade it that way. But if something goes parabolic on you, this stop's going to go parabolic. The problem with that is if something goes parabolic, you're going to have a sharp retrace. I can almost guarantee that. But in many cases, not all the time, the stock will take off again after that sharp retrace. In fact, I'll actually trade that pattern in and of itself, a deep pullback in an accelerated trend. I call it accelerated 
momentum strategy, strategy, especially with a deep pullback. Now, in this particular case, it didn't work out, so you could make a case for the SAR. But like I just said, your SAR would have probably got you out right here or definitely right here or maybe even, maybe, believe it or not, even right here, and then you, would, you wouldn't have gotten anything on this trade, okay, to each his own, okay? Now, again, better to have loved and lost some open profits. So what? You lost a little bit right here. Where did you, what did you end up? You ended up at 153. You went from here to here, okay? I'll take that any day of the week, okay? So, again, better to have loved and lost some of your open profits than to never have loved at all. Okay. Now, a lot, lot of questions stacking up, and that's great. I'm excited about this because, see, I'm glad I'm covering this again. I was worried I was kind of beating a dead horse in this. We'll get to them in just one second. Let me just finish two more slides. Um, when you're widening the stops to try to capture those longer-term gains, you need to pay attention to increasing volatility. Now, we see ourselves as being long the trend, okay? But we're also long volatility, believe it or not. It's almost like trading an option. I hate to, I don't want to get into trouble talking about options too much. But when you buy an option, you're long volatility and you're long trend, okay? And that trend better materialize quickly, and that volatility better increase, okay, or some combination thereof. Otherwise, you're not going to make any money on your option, okay? Well, you're looking for the same sort of move in trend. You want to make as much money as possible, and you want to make money fast, okay? We had that TKO move. This stock was at a strong trend. Uh, my thinking was that, this thing's going to snap straight back and have this nice long trend. Well, it kind of meandered for a while, but eventually it did take off, okay? Now, one other point about that before we actually look at what that looks like. The characteristics begin to change. Your kitty, okay, becomes a tiger. You end up with a tiger by the tail, and then hopefully, if you do end up with a tiger by a tail, you want to give it some room to breathe. So let's take a look at what happened when this stock finally did take off, okay, it based around, based around, volatility didn't do a whole lot, probably stayed about where it was, maybe dropped even a little bit, and then finally you get this acceleration and trend, which is followed by a massive jump in volatility, okay. So now you're getting these super wide range bars. Let me clean this chart up a little bit. Let's look at the range on this bar. A lot of people are, are, are fans of ATR, okay, there you go. Here's your little ATR speech. So you look at your ATR here, it's pretty small, okay? But then look at your ATR here. It's getting bigger and bigger and bigger, okay? So you're getting this huge move at both price and daily range. So everything's kind of expanding. And then you can just look at your volatility reading and see, wow, volatility is going through the roof on this. So if you're trailing that stop, once the volatility and price begins to increase, in other words, you're getting an acceleration and trend, then you need to let that stop widen out naturally by not going up as fast as the market is going up, and then hopefully you're able to ride out that correction, and that was what, July? Let's go back and look at what happened in July. Okay, here's where it took off, okay, and we trailed it at a slightly decelerating rate, and then what happened? Well, it based for a little while, but we were able to ride out corrections, and then it took off again, and you still made another 25% over the next uh, couple of months. And even that is a pretty darn, darn good, darn good um, move, okay? So there's another reason for widening the stop, okay? A couple more slides, and then we'll get to those questions. Um, sometimes you have to play games with yourself. And, and I like to – I mean, this is how I learned early on. Uh, and one of the games I used to play is called Keep the Change. Still do for some matter, for, you know. Uh, for the most part, let's say now this is a let's we're assuming this is a, a higher price stock. Let's say it's a thirty thirty dollars stock, and let's say it goes up thirty seven cents one day, and you've got a really nice profit. You've been in, you've been in for a few months. Well, you could just say, you know what, I'm not going to bother ratcheting my stop up thirty seven cents, and then your stop widens by thirty seven cents. Let's say it goes up ten cents tomorrow. Don't worry about it. The other twenty cents the following day. Don't worry about it. And then once you get a few points in here, and then let's say it starts moving again, then you can start bumping that stop up again, okay? Once it, once it kind of widens again naturally, especially if you're playing like the keep the change game, and it starts to add up a little bit, then you kind of begin to 
let that, uh, I'm sorry, notch that stop up a little bit, okay? And then one more thing to talk about is, the other thing is like, uh, I kind of see it as gaining ground. Every time your stop goes higher, you have boring overnight gaps locked in that much more profits. So let's say a stock goes up three points, okay? Then bring your stop up by two points. So now you've gained ground. You've gained ground by two points, okay? And then you also allow that stop to widen by one point, in this particular case, three minus two. And that might help you ride out a correction, okay? And then say it takes off again. When it makes a new high, let's say it goes up four points, well, maybe you'll just come up by three points or whatever. And again, let that stop widen out because hopefully the volatility is increasing as the trend has begun to accelerate, okay? Now, a lot of questions coming in. This is fantastic. I'm excited to see so many questions because I thought I kind of beat the dead horse on this, okay? Do you put a stop below a base when the trade is first created or is it done after it starts to show a profit? Well, it depends. It depends if you have a base to work with. You go back to the NG trade in here, okay? And where was the stop? The stop was somewhere down here in the base. It wasn't necessarily below the base, but it was at the base. Now, I measured this move here, and you ATR people can use ATR. Problem with ATR is the ATR was pretty low here, and then all of a sudden it began to accelerate. So which ATR are you using? For me, I can just eyeball a stock and say, wow, this is a pretty big, pretty big move from there to there. I better have a stop that's about the same size, okay? And then lo and behold, that stop would put me back at this base just by chance, okay? But I do look at the prior base. If there is a prior base, and say, okay, where would I be wrong? One of my favorite patterns, I guess every pattern is a favorite pattern, but pattern I like to trade sometimes is a first pullback after a base breakout. Let me just redraw that, okay? So let's say you got a nice base, and you sort of have it down here, okay? you got a nice base. And you got a breakout and your first pullback. That's a good that's a good place to enter on that first pullback after the base breakout. If this stock triggers and then comes all the way back in and you're back at the base, then you're no longer in a trend. Draw your trend line, draw your arrows. This is what your arrow will look like as opposed to this followed by this. Okay, and then if it takes off, then obviously you've got your, your big blue arrow or red arrow in this case working for you. So you don't necessarily put it below that base if you have one, but you could certainly use the base and say, okay, well, I know my stop needs to be about that wide at least, and hey, guess what? By the time I trigger, uh, if I measure that wide from there to there, uh, yeah, that's going to put me back around the bottom of this base. So I know I'm, I know I'm definitely wrong there. Uh, the problem is, let's say we just get a generic pullback and you got to stop here. Well, you don't really know if you're wrong there or if it's good you know, or you're wrong. You, know, you don't never know. You never know how far you have to put that stop away for this stock to correct to it and then go back up again. So you have to put it a pretty good ways away when you enter just a generic pullback, just in case it corrects on you. If you do have a base to work with, then you could use that base to help you out, okay? Dave, do you ever have a scenario where after a set of triggers, but before IPT is reached, where you would exit the position or significantly tighten your existing stop? Okay. Before we get to the second part of your question, Fred, the answer is maybe. Okay. Uh, if you, let's say we get this little swing trade here, and let's say our IPT is here, and we'll look at the portfolio and find out where it was anyway. And let's say day one it does this, day two it does this. Even though we're not quite there, because we got there so quick, we know we're going to probably have some sort of correction before this thing takes off again, if it is going to take off again. So, yeah, it depends on if you've got a profit within a couple of days that's pretty big and you've made a lot of ground towards your IPT. Even if you're not already there, then there's nothing wrong with taking profits a little bit early in that particular case, provided that it's been a fast move and provided that you're, I'm just going to pull a number out there, let's say three-quarters of the way to your IPT, and that's just a round number over a short, short period of time. Then by all means, lock and load, because you know that market is due to correct on you, okay? Now, whether the trend resumes or not, you don't know, but it's okay. It's kind of a gift horse type of situation. So, you know, here's the thing, too. Everything I do 
at least I personally I think, and, and hopefully it's not a mystery to anyone else, but everything I do I think is very common sense oriented, okay? It's common sense that if the market makes a fast move, even if you don't have that initial profit target over a couple of days, you know it's probably going to correct on you. So, hey, don't look a gift of horse in the mouth. Take some partial profits. Now, if it goes up a little bit and you got a $100 profit on your position and you're looking for at least 1000 then no, that that you don't take that. Don't eat like a what's the old commodity uh, commodity adage? Don't eat like a bird, and poo like an elephant, right? Don't take little bitty gains and then big old losses. Okay. For once, we thought we'd have one uh, <laughs> one show where we didn't talk about poop, huh? Okay. Now the question is, or do you always just let the market stop you out? Assuming IPT is not reach. Uh, no. Okay, so the question is, do you ever take profits a little early? Yes, on a fast move. Uh, or do you just let the market stop you out? Uh, no. If it's a fast move, then by all means, take profits early, okay? Now, I'm going to pull up the spreadsheet, the live spreadsheet here in a few minutes, or a relatively live spreadsheet. We'll punch some new numbers in it to make it somewhat live. The spreadsheet that I show every day in the service is a mechanical spreadsheet, okay? So if this stock gets right here, I am not going to, put that this stock got close enough for government work to the initial profit target. Will I personally take profits there? Am I interviewing myself? Yes, I am. Will I personally take profits there? Absolutely. Okay. But for tracking purposes, just to, just so I don't confuse the heck out of everyone, I track things on a mechanical basis. I want to make sure things work mechanically, but let me tell you this. Things work a heck of a lot better with a little bit of common sense and a little bit of discretion. And you're going to be amazed at how much difference that makes. And it doesn't have to it, – it's not like you go in there, oh, Dave, you could say discretion here, discretion there. No, what I'm saying is not discretion every day of your life. When I went back and audited last uh, decade or so of every official, quote, unquote, official recommendation I made to service – and I put a little discretion in there because I had I actually took notes in real time and I had records to show when discretion was used in some cases. And uh, most cases it was pretty obvious. And it's amazing. It's only like once a quarter you have to apply a little bit of discretion. But that little bit of discretion, staying with the stop when the stock, when the stop STOP is nicked, can make all the difference in the world, can keep you in a big winner on occasion. Um Taking profits a little early when you got a fast move, like, um, I don't know if that was Fred just has a question or not. Uh, I think it was Fred. Like Fred just said, when you get uh, close to that uh, additional profit target over a short period of time, yeah, lock and load, okay? Little things like that can really make a year. you got a brain in your head. Use it. Don't try to outsmart the market, okay? But if the market gives you a gift or if the market tries to give you like a minor screwing, like if it nicks your stop, or let's say you come in, the market's uh, down, futures are down sharply, and the market gaps through your stop, okay? Then maybe wait a few minutes and see if that stock reverses and goes straight back up. If it does, then put your stop back in. It's all in, it's all in the second half of layman's, and it's also on, I've got a couple of articles on my website on discretion. So, yeah, a little bit of discretion could go a long, long ways, okay? If you use a wire to stop, your profit target also increases? No, no. No, 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 no. Your profit target is always going to be your initial profit target. I call it the IPT. It's always going to be the same. And as soon as you get that, you're going to bump that stop up to break even. Over here, how much is enough? I don't know. 10,000%. Uh, okay. You want at least to make your, new, your next profit target is going to be 10,000%. Okay. If you make 10,000%, then yeah, you could, you could take profits then. Okay. But you want. You want this to be, a, I'm making a joke here, but you want this to be unlimited. And as a very good presentation, if I say so myself, I was looking at it a couple days ago. It's not too bad. Uh, it's on my website. You can, you can download it. There's a nominal fee. I'm not trying to be a, a popsicle stick salesman or anything, but it, it does cost money to do all these things, and it is nice to recoup some of that. But I did a very good presentation in one of these weekend charts where I talked about risk versus reward and how to avoid a negative expectancy. And I would encourage you to go to my website and get that uh, presentation. Okay, so you're you're not you're never moving your your initial profit target is always the same. Once you get it, you move your stop to break even, 
and then hopefully you ride out a longer term trend. In fact, we're going to pull a spreadsheet up here in just a bit, and uh, hopefully that'll make a lot more sense. Okay. Okay. Let me get the spreadsheet up, and then we'll. Um, I'll keep going with those questions because the spreadsheet might actually answer some of the questions. And I got to catch this thing before it uh, pops up, or you can see something you're not supposed to see. Uh, oh, good. Okay, I already got it fixed. Okay. Now the next question is, what date was the risk reward? I think it was like ten. Um, I want to say it was ten something October. It was called risk. If you, if you come here to education webinars, and then you just hit your control F key and do a search on on. Um, if you get the archives, you got you got everything. And and you know not to pimp this stuff, but there's a lot of good stuff in there. I mean, if you like what you're hearing today, this is the same thing I talk about every week. So you can get the entire years here. If you want an individual show, if you hit control F and type in the word risk, you'll see that. Somewhere down here in October, we did one. There, there you go, 1017. Understanding the importance of risk versus reward, sticking with the system or not, money and position management. Okay, you can read all the descriptions on these. But I would recommend just get the whole year. I, you know, I think it's worth it. it you know, here's the deal. If, if I pay $1,000 to go to a webinar or a seminar or whatever, um, you know, I probably paid a lot more than that just last week at weekend before. If I get one idea, boy, that's that, I paid for my whole uh, deal, okay? And I think you get more than just that one idea. But thanks, thank you, Dax, for asking that, okay? Do you have a definitive list of cases where you take discretion? If you do, it would be nice list of rules for maintaining d uh, discipline. Okay, I don't have a definitive list, but if you look on the um, – if you look on my website and look at the discretionary rules, I call them quote unquote rules, there are some cases where discretion is pretty obvious. Okay. Opening gap reversals, stop nicks, uh, near misses on profit targets. It, it's pretty to me it's pretty cut and dry, okay? Let's say you're in a stock and it's trending in your direction like CLDX. Your stock that exhibits a first thrust down or multi-year highs like CLDX. Okay, before we go any further on that, you follow your system is what you do, okay? And I know where you're going on that, okay? So he's saying you got a stock that's going along its merry way. You're trailing your stop just like Big Dave says, okay? And then all of a sudden this stock makes a first thrust down. Well, I have a perfect case in point on that, and it might actually be stopping out today. So even though you got the short-term negative working, you're going to still follow your system, and you're going to still stick with that stock. And you're probably going to say, oh, crud, I'm probably going to get stopped out because this looks a little ugly in here. But you never know, because not all transitional patterns work. Sometimes you get a transitional pattern, they do this, and then they take off again. And I hate to say it, but you end up with like an A, B, C type of correction. You know, a little one, two, three, a little one, two, three, or A, B, C type of correction. Okay, those, I, I wouldn't try to trade this kind of correction, but if you're already in the trade, let it unfold. Okay, in fact, when we get to, uh, if you look at the spreadsheet, let's take a look at this TAN. Okay, it hasn't stopped out yet. It's the stop's at 40.55, okay? So let's take a look at what TAN looks like. TAN, okay? So if I was just seeing this, I'd be like, oh, my God, this is a really ugly stock, okay? Because you do have the first thrust down, and it does look like it's trying to resume its downtrend. Well, just leave your stop in place. And so what if you get stopped out? If you back the chart way out, you can see it's still in a pretty good trend, and it is selling off, but this isn't off of, like, all-time highs or something in here. This might just be a major correction in this in this trend here. Okay, now if this was off all-time highs, yeah, I'd be a little bit more worried about it, and and it might stop us out. And if it does, so what? I've learned to become more matter of fact when it comes to these things, and my life has gotten a lot better. Okay, can you talk about acceleration of trend and increased volatility, rather a change in character as opposed, or the difference in reverses of mean and a pullback? kind of lost me there. 
what I'm what I'm saying or trying to say, I think, is that if you have if you do it properly, and this kind of dovetails into something else too, I can show you real quick. But let's say you're trading the reversion to the mean in the direction of the trend. In other words, a pullback. Okay, stock rallies up. It pulls back, so you know there's a pretty good chance the rubber band is stretched down. There's a chance that this rubber band is going to pop back in the direction of the trend. Okay, if you did it properly and there's no overhead resistance, and you watch those 14 hours where I talked about stock selection, and your sector also looks pretty good, and most other stocks within the sector look pretty good, and the market looks pretty good, there's a chance that this stock might not only give you that little pop but it might actually begin to accelerate higher and make the mother of all moves if you did everything properly. So when that happens, what happens with the volatility? You, you, your stock's about this volatile, and all of a sudden your volatility is going to go up significantly. Now, can you have too much of a good thing? Absolutely. I trade stocks that, I, that let's just say they're medium to high volatility stocks. Okay, I don't trade super high volatile stocks because once it becomes this volatile, What's left to expand? Okay, now the next thing is, well, Dave, when it becomes real volatile, the stock goes straight up, why don't you exit? Well, I don't know. If I'm already in, then maybe I'll be able to ride out that correction, and maybe it'll keep on going. I don't want to establish a new position in something that's become super-duper volatile, okay, if it's too volatile. But if I'm already in, then so what? Follow the plan, stay the course, let's see how things shake out. Maybe it becomes super, super-duper volatile. And maybe it goes straight up, and then you get the mother of all winners, okay? So I don't know if, um, I'm, okay, I answered your question. Okay, I wasn't sure what the question was, but I but somehow I answered it. Thank you so much, okay? Yeah, Albert, your profit target never increases, okay? Once you widen your stop, though, your, your risk to open losses increases, but if you're gaining ground, so what, okay? Again, so let's say it goes up three points. You go up two points. You gain two points. You're not going to make two more dollars when you get stopped out on this position, okay? Yeah, I know. You're going to lose these three points, but at least you'll make two points, okay? Or that, well, whatever the stop may be at that point in time, okay? But you, at least you made $2 more than you did yesterday, okay? Or whatever, however long it takes for you to gain some ground. So every day... You ratchet that little trailing stop up, even though you're giving up more and more of your open gains. And again, don't monetize those. Don't look at them too hard, right? You're still gaining ground. So if you get stopped out, you might only make 100%. Only 100%. That's better than poking the eye. Okay. Okay, let's say you're in a stock and it's trending in a direction like CLDX. Your stock that exhibits the first thrust down multi-year high like CLDX. Okay, we talked that. Not a knockout. If you were looking at the stock like a virgin, you'd think about short to get on the pullback. Absolutely. You would think about a first thrust. Would that be the place for your last line of defense on your long position? Okay, that's the second half of Rick's question. And the answer is no, because like I said, Sometimes a first thrust don't work out. Sometimes it's just a correction and they go back up, okay? But, yeah, if you were just seeing it in and of itself as a new position and you weren't already long, then, yeah, it might, it might, it might be worth a stab, okay? But sometimes you'll have a major correction and it takes off again. Remember, we're transitioning. We are what? What do we start out as when we go into a position? Let's, let's get a little – let's bring it let's, – let's boil it back down – to our stick figures. Let's reduce it back down to its essence, okay? We are a trader. We're kind of a swing trader, really, if you think about it, okay? And then we are transitioning into a trend follower. Now, when we see a new position, and let's say we've got some trend following positions that are working for us, that's all fine and dandy. We see a new position, we're still a trader, okay, on a new position. So you got a new position doing this, by all means, look to short it if you really, really like the setup. If you are over here and you see that, you've already changed hats and you've got a nice long-term profit, then just say, you know, as we say in Fargo, oh, geez, oh, geez, but maybe, just maybe, the stock will turn around before it hits your stop 
And then you go on and you stay with that position for a long, long time. Now, to each his own, you can do whatever you want, okay? That's what makes the market. Dave, I think to effectively utilize a widen, the stop, and let your positions on the second level run, you need to not be watching the market every day, no? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I've got quote screens up, and I watch every tick, and, and, and while I'm giving this presentation, I'm watching uh, the quotes flash and go by. But that doesn't mean that I'm taking action on that. I just like to see what's going on. Now, if uh, – who was it? Um, I think I, I just saw him last week or a week before speaking. What's his name? What is his name? Sakota. I think Sakota said one of the market wizards, having a quote machine on your desk is like having a slot machine on your desk, and you, you're going to want to feed it. Okay? And, uh, you know, I've been guilty of that too. So you've got to be careful not to feed the beast, feed the slot machine. But, yeah, if you're in a longer-term position – you really don't have to watch every single tick on that position. Now, sometimes there's a little discretion here and there, especially like on the open, if there's an opening gap reversal situation or something like that. But for the most part, just let it go, okay? It's only human to, burn, to bum while watching 150% profit end up as a 50% profit. Well, I doubt that that would happen. I mean, that's a pretty big... That's a pretty big swing. I don't think I ever remember that big of a swing. But, yeah, it went from 211% to 152%. That's a pretty big swing. I mean, that's an ouch. Damn, that sucked, you know. But wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. 152%. That's better than poking the eye, okay. In fact, let's look at let's look at what that looks like. See, I put some of these. Uh, these are the last one, two, th three, four. These are the last five trades that stopped out, okay. And you can see that, no, I don't have it in here. I thought I had a CLDX in here. Well, the CLDX made $8,000 on that second loaf, okay? And that's a pretty big number when you consider that that's on a 100K account, so that's 8% move. So if it did that, if you annualize that, that one stock made 16% for you and a little bit more if you add in that extra $1,000 that you made in the first loaf, okay? For a reversion to the mean pullback, do you put the stop below the last low? No. you got to be outside the volatility. Okay? Um, John, if you have my first two books on ebook, when I re I didn't rewrite them, I just rewrote the, uh, um, the intro to them, and I talked about you, you need to, the stop needs to be outside of the normal volatility of the market. If you're in a rip-roaring bull market, then, yeah, put your stop right below the low of the pullback. But that's going to be a target for uh, people, okay? So you need, to, you need to keep in mind volatility when you're setting those stops. And that's probably too tight. Parabolic stop would work if you increase the volatility factor once you switch to longer trend mode. TK has volatility stop. Yeah, Albert, if you want to play with that, knock yourself out. Um, I'm not a big fan of parabolic stops. Um, you know, what you got to realize is... It might work 10 times in a row where that parabolic stop gets you out up towards that 211% or whatever. It will get you out at, I don't know, 195%. You feel great. And then it happens again. You get a stock runs 100%. It gets you out at 80% or 90%, okay? And you feel pretty good. And that might happen 10 times, and you're feeling like a freaking genius, okay? And then that one time that that stock takes off and never ever looks back that would have made you a year okay or your decade then that parabolic stop I can almost guarantee you will take you out and again you got to be really careful when you're looking at all this stuff if you're looking at these perfect examples you would say wow what, what got me out of 200 percent profit as opposed to and only gave up you know, a little bit of that profit from 211 percent to 200 but you got to ask yourself, what did it take you out earlier in the process to where you to watch that extra 100% profit materialize and you're sitting there without a position? And sometimes stocks don't let you back in. And that CLDX is a good example. It just kind of meandered sideways forever. Then, bam, it took off again. And it did that several times. Okay. Oh, okay, no problem. Uh, uh, yeah, Albert says he doesn't actually use them. He's just kind of... Um, making conversation. That's fine. Yeah, I mean, play with that stuff you want to. I'll play with everything, okay? 
I, I put everything in the world on my charts, and then I've stripped it all off, and then I just use common sense and keep it simple, okay? John says, if the last low is too tight, will be a good stop, et cetera, near a base, or at least account for Well, it depends. Like we said earlier, if you do have a base, then put it below the base, okay? If you don't have a base, then put it at a, sp a spot where you're obviously wrong on that initial profit target. Also, look at the recent ranges. Again, you got to look at it. If it's bouncing around three or four points a day, you can't use a two-point stop. You're going to probably have to use like a five-point stop because you're outside of that normal volatility. Look at how much it's moved over a short period of time. If it moves, if it moves a tremendous amount, then you know that stock can move a tremendous amount, and it won't always be in your favor. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it takes a little time to get your stops right. But, but you know, it, it, I, I say this almost every week. I have fixed so many people that can't, I can't catch trends in my life, Dave. Okay, first of all, let's look at your let's let's look at your stops. And tight stops are universally preached. Like last week, the myth of tight stops. By the way, that article is on my website. I did find it yesterday. So if you go into education, uh, the myth of tight stops is on there. So if you've got your stop within a normal volatility, you're going to get stopped out. So I had somebody come to me. This happens more than once. I had one guy, 19 trades, one guy, 20 trades or 21 trades in a row. They got stopped out on. It's like, well, two things. One, your stops are probably too tight, or your stock picking is uh, could use a little work, okay? It's too bad there's not a stock picking webinar that would help. Hmm. Let me make a note. I'm going to have to do that. Anyway, I fixed a lot of people who are good stock pickers already, just by telling them to widen their stops. You're going to catch a lot more trends if you widen your stop. Yeah, when you get stopped out, it's going to hurt a little bit, but if you're only risking a certain position on each trade, then it shouldn't really matter, okay? Okay, what's the CLDX example when you're widening stop on the second loaf? Are you watching the level two? I don't know what you mean by level two. Like level two quote screen? As you get close to the stop location, you said it's a bummer, even though you've made a nice money. Does that mean you watch it closer at that point? Um, you, if it comes near your stop, whenever you know, here's one of your discretionary rules. Whenever one of your stocks, okay, let's say what's today, April tenth, two thousand fourteen. At the end of the day, TAN is probably going to be close to my stop. So on Friday, April 11, 2014, I'm going to say, oh, okay, well, this TAN is pretty close to getting stopped out. Eh, futures getting whacked pre-market. Let's just imagine they are. They might be tomorrow morning. Um, I'm pretty close to getting stopped out. Let me just see what happens on the open. And if it nicks that stop or just barely touches it and takes off again, then I'm going to say, okay, I may have dodged a bullet. I'm going to leave that stop in place or put that stop back in and stay with it. So that's where you could use a little discretion. If you're in a stock and a stop, STOP is a long ways away, then there's really not much to do, okay? Yeah, Jonathan, I hear you. I mean, it, it, it does... It is a little painful when you give up some of those open profits, but you got to look at things on a net net basis, and you got to be consistent, and you got to chip away at it. You got to have a plan. If you have a plan, just follow your plan, okay? And you'll do fine longer term. Dave, why would you sell at resisted levels and place buy stops above those levels? And continue to be a trend, okay? That that's great in theory. That's great in hindsight, okay? But now you're, now you're complicating matters, and now you're turning yourself into a breakout trader, okay? So he said, he said well, okay, it goes to the base. Let's, let's get out. Uh, oh, it breaks out. Let's buy this breakout. Oh, wait a minute. It came right back in. Let's get out. Um, okay, oh, here it breaks out again. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, it came all the way back into the base. We better get out, okay? No, you can't do that, okay? Now, if you want to be a Darvis box style trader, and that's your methodology, I only buy boxes, and I buy boxes on top of boxes. And when it comes back in, you know, if you're using like point and figure or something, I tried using point and figure once. I'd point a chart and try to figure out how I lost so much money. 
But all jokes aside, point and figure has some merit, I suppose, because it's support and resistance. It's kind of like building those Darvis boxes. If that's the kind of trader you are, then fine. Don't try to figure everything out because you can't. Okay, we're we're looking to capture a short term gain, and if that turns into a longer term gain and materializes, then we're going to ride out that trend. Now, once we got the tiger by the tail, we widen the stop out. We give it plenty of room. So what do we do now? Nothing. We go out and we look for the next tiger. We go tiger hunting. Okay. So instead of micromanaging, instead of micromanaging the tiger you already have. Leave them alone, okay? Give him rum. Leave him alone and go out and find the next tiger. Spend that energy doing that. Everybody tries to figure out everything, and you'll make yourself crazy doing that. I spent many, many years doing that, okay? And then it's taken me many years to kind of peel away everything. It's kind of, it kind of goes to like those, a lot of the Eastern philosophies. It's like when you reach the beginning, you have reached... You know, you go all the way back to the beginning, you know, you you have to go through this big, long journey to reach the beginning. You have to get to the end to reach the beginning. Hopefully that makes sense. Uh, I do a, 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 a presentation sometimes called The Trader's Journey. If you go on YouTube, it's out there. And you'll see where I start with the blank chart. I'm like, hmm, looks like it's going up. I better add a moving average. better add an oscillator. better add a standard deviation band. You know, I start adding all these things, and before you know it, I could no longer see the chart, okay? And then at that point, I start peeling the, the indicators off, and guess what we have left? We have a chart with a big blue arrow pointing higher that's pulled back, okay? And I could save you about 10 years of searching. <laughs> you could just follow my methodology. Okay, I got you know I got a guy emails me twenty times a day. What about this? What about this? And why not do this? And why not do that? I'm like, if you want to do all that, then you could do all that, and that's fine. Okay, it sounds like you're off on your own little journey, and that's fine. But this is what I figured out. This is what works for me. It's not my way or the highway. It's not perfect, and no methodologies are, and it's no holy grail. But this is how it works, and this is what I found. And I've been through that grail hunt, but it just seems like everybody has to go through that grail hunt. For some reason, you have to go through that crazy trader's journey where you chase that uh, um, stuff. <laughs> okay, Jonathan. <laughs> My trader's journey can be best described like a dog chasing his own tail. Now, I'll keep it simple. Yeah, Tono, you got it. You, you know, Tono's got it. He's got his own way of doing things. Um, we've talked a few times on the phone. And, yeah, keep it simple. And it takes you a while to find what's right for you, okay? And like I say, it's not my way or the highway. If you can take some of my stuff and make your stuff better, then absolutely, okay? Now, let me just uh, show you the spreadsheet real quick. Now, keep in mind, we don't have a lot of big winners, so there's nothing very exciting to talk about just yet. But we're looking for a small gain on the initial loaf, and everything that's not highlighted is, is uh, profit taken, okay? Now, one thing, reason, one reason I'm bringing up the spreadsheet is we were talking about not using stops. Now, these aren't extreme examples, but let's just let's just say that we didn't use stop and, and this stock went to zero. Okay. Well, that's going to give you a ten thousand dollar loss. That's a ten percent loss on a hundred k account. If that happens a couple times, you're going to be in a whole lot of trouble. And if you enter stock like um, like a higher price stock without a huge um, stop in it. I'm sorry, a higher price stock, which is going to require more of your margin. Let's say this Jilly, it goes to $200 a share because you're not using stops. Okay, your loss on that is going to be $28,000. So if you don't use stops, you could end up losing $28,000 on one position. That's a short, and in theory, your losses are unlimited. Okay, uh, we've got a nine point stop in that one. So you can see that some of these shorts are beginning to work. That's the other reason I want to show you this is that we've got a couple of shorts that are working. Uh, we're giving up some open profits on tan. We got stopped out of this one at a scratch, but we made a thousand bucks better than poke in the eye. We got stopped out of this one at a pretty decent profit, the GME. We made um, a little bit on the first and a little bit on the second, not bad. Okay, we got stopped out of this one. The trend never really did materialize, but it's better than poking the eye. 
Okay, so you can see we got knocked out of some longs and one short during the last move, and then now we got triggered in two shorts. Okay. And then one long. The long is in foods, and it's the, that's the defensive area right now. And so we'll see how things are going. Now, if this market continues to slide, you'll probably see more and more shorts in here, and you'll see some of these other stocks stop out. And maybe, just maybe, gold, we've got a little gold stock left over here, that might trade contra to the overall market. And maybe this URZ might trade contra to the overall market. So there's an ebb and flow that happens in the portfolio, and that's why I'm showing you this. And the real money is right here in the second loaf of the position. So let's say this uh, let's say this stock goes to ten bucks. Okay, now you got a fourteen thousand dollar gain. It could happen. I mean, we had a little solo go from five to thirty bucks. Okay, so that makes that can make you here. That makes all the difference in the world. Okay, and you just kind of chip away at it, and then bam, you get a big winner like CLDX, and then you go back to chipping away at it. Okay. Okay, glad you're talking about shorts. I have trouble uh, figuring out stops after the first loaf is, loaf is taken. Well, you, you move your stop to zero. So I was getting ready to talk about shorts being a pain. So let's just let's bang that out real quick. Uh, some of you guys have seen this graphic before, so bear with me. In an ideal world, you get an entry on a short. You put a stop here. It goes down. You probably take your IPT off. You know, you get your stop to break even, and then you just trail a stop lower okay this is what happens in reality okay you get an entry looks pretty good for a day or so the end is go straight up stops you out and then what happens it that it sells off bounces around okay so it's really hard to hang on to a short the good news is that I don't want to digress too far is but sometimes you get a short it does this it has a sharp retrace and then it drops again and it sets up like a witch hat and somebody was asking about an add-on trade or putting a trade back on, sometimes you will get those patterns that will happen. Let's just take a look at Gilead, for instance, as uh, this is a recent short. Okay. By the way, I, I've got 10 years of these trades out there. If you want to go in and look at them, good, bad, different, warts and all, okay, you can go out and do it. Um, you know, people always say, let me see some, let me see, Dave, why don't you give me a free trial of service? Well, uh, here, it's 10 years. Go look at that, you know, and good traders make good decisions fast. Make <laughs> Make decisions fast. If you can't decide with 10 years of data, then you probably should be trading. But notice that you get a trigger, and you're thinking, wow, this, uh, this shorting thing is fun. This is going to be great. I'm going to make a lot of money on this short. And what does it do? Bam, it goes straight back up. And then what happens? Well, now it implodes, okay? So let's say if you didn't take this trade and you were just seeing it, maybe you might look at this and say, okay, that's a, that's a witch hat. Maybe I might take that trade on the downside. But the short side is always a pain in the buttocks, usually. There's an old adage that all shorts go against you. Um, it just seems to be true. It just seems like it happens. And then, of course, you get the real move. Now, we're not micromanaging everything. We're not putting our stop in right above that peak, right? Look what happened. How do it know, okay? Some, let's, let's not call him a name. Well, we can call him a name. <laughs> I think I'd be willing to bet you. I'd be willing to bet you lunch that some market maker said, hey, where's that prior little high and the pullback here, a little Dave Landry pattern? Let's take those guys out. What they don't know is our stop's way up here somewhere, giving it plenty enough room to breathe. Old Dave, yeah. I mean, I'd, I'd keep, try to keep that stop as tight as I could, uh, but that's not the reality. The reality is we have to trade the markets, so it'll take a little bit looser stop. Okay. So shorts are a pain in the butt. Make no bones about it. Now, the good news is they do slide faster than they glide. So I think this Gilead has potential to be a big winner. Okay? And think about it. This stock up here was priced for perfection. $80 something dollars a share. It's a big old thick stock. Everybody that brother is an analyst on this stock. It's probably every major portfolio in the world owns this stock as a growth stock. And it's been a pretty good growth stock. The problem is, what happens when momentum ends? It ends badly. We talked about it last week. That's the baby poop thing, okay? So this stock could easily be 60 bucks, 50 bucks, 40 bucks, or even 30 bucks a share. You get 100% retrace on this rally. I mean, what are they doing now 
that they weren't doing a year ago? Have they solved the world's problems? I don't know. Maybe they have. I, who knows? Uh, who cares? I mean, I hope they did, but uh, not until uh, we get, excuse me, not until we at least get the initial profit target. The um, Mountain Dew's creeping up on me. Anyway, I wanted to show you the portfolio. I think I just pulled out. Here, hang on. Okay, I wanted to show you the portfolio just so we could punch some numbers in here and I could show you how badly you can get hurt. When I was going in and doing some auditing on all this, every night in I had fat finger an extra zero or a zero in a position. And it was amazing how that would decimate the returns. So it's very important to use stops. I know we got into a conversation about not using stops last week, but it's very important that you do use stops in your, um, in your trading, okay? Just to decide what's your opinion of the whole flash trade of controversy. Uh, I'm glad it's being looked into. I'm a huge fan of open markets and no regulations. But when, I think I said this last week, if uh, somebody at the, the APTA conference was telling me about a, a guy he knows, they moved their firm from one side of the office building to the other so that they, they can get better executions. Uh, if your executions are that crucial, then you probably shouldn't be trading. And I also think that if you're going to stuff the quote channel and do all this fun and games, there's anybody, there was an IPO coming public, and I don't have the link, just take my word for it. They had like uh, 1,400 or 14,000 profitable trading days and one day where they lost money. Um, nobody is that good, okay? There's some sort of fun and games that must be happening. And I'm glad they tried to come public because it, it just threw up a big red flag to the SEC instead of just being quiet about the whole thing uh, and throw it out. So here's my solution. Um, and I talked with someone a couple of years back on this, and, and they agree with me. They think that it would solve 99% of all flash trading. If you are going to offer a bid on a stock, you have to honor that bid for one second. Come on, guys, one second. You mean you don't want to, you know, it, it, you have to be willing to honor that bid for one second. So I think that would, would fix it, okay? I used to work for the guy. You used to work for the guy that moved? No, really? Virtue, V-I-R-T-U. Wow. Wow. What were you, uh, Jonathan, were you programming? This is fascinating. Um, the guy left with the guy with 1,400 days of profits. Yeah, is that that's is that the firm Virtue V I R T U, V I R T U. Okay, cool. Were you programming or what were you doing? I like the sixty minutes where the the exchange took a took a coil of uh, oh you were trading. <laughs> ah, okay, cool. Um, he took a he he had to build his new exchange and he took a coil of uh, fiber optic cable and put a half a mile or so fiber optic cable in there to slow the uh, slow the quotes down. Whoa, you lost me in that, John. If a stop too wide is a stop too wide, if I set it from the last low of the pullback as a reference level and then adding to the largest range of the recent price for us to this, I don't know, John, you got to take it on a case-by-case -case basis. If you can give me an exact example, oh, we could do that. Oh, wow. Jonathan said he realized that humans weren't as accurate as machines, so he fired everyone. All right, well, well Jonathan, you, are, you and I are probably in the same, uh, same place now. I would love to see the results if you did an A-B study where A, you utilized the loaf method, and in B, you actively watched levels and traded in and out. It would take a year to get accurate results, but I think you might be surprised by the extra yield from the better managing those huge gains on the second loaf before they become... Just nice gains, just my opinion. Well, Jonathan was a flash trader, so um, I know it's hard for you to sit on the position. Yeah, but what you don't realize is, you know, that's a really tough thing to quantify. And to each its own, Jonathan, I think, it, you know, sometimes these things, you got to realize, here's the big deal. Or here's the deal, I should say, not the big deal. A lot of times in these moves, what you have to realize is, it's not as easy as getting back in, okay? And I hear you, and I know what you're saying, and I'm thinking statistically 
you're probably right, but it's that one outlier that's going to kill you. So what happens is, I'll give you a case in point. This is my favorite example ever. We bought a stock, it triggered, and then it flatlined for two months, okay? So your system would say we should probably get out, okay? Probably get out about right there, or in Jonathan's case, about, about right there, 10 seconds after they got in. Well, guess what? They got bought out. Okay, and the stock jumped ten bucks or whatever, ten fifteen bucks overnight, and it was about a ten dollar stock, so it's a hundred percent overnight. Well, had you not stayed in, which I'm sure some of my clients bailed out, you wouldn't have gotten that gain. So if you got a tiger by the tail and you're trading that momentum, and that momentum begins to increase, now this is this is a bad example because the momentum died out. But sometimes you're going to get a big gap overnight in the direction of the trend, and you're going to miss that. Okay. But again, yeah, if you want to, if you want to go in and out, that's fine. Uh, you know, it, it's to each his own. But you're also spending time and effort and money, uh, money from a frictional cost basis. You're spending commissions. You're getting slippage. You're wasting mental energy trying to get in and out on the trade. To me, it's like, hey, I got a tiger by the tail. Okay, I got a good look at stock here. Like I said, I'm in one. I've been in forever. It seems like forever. It's about, probably gonna be a year here soon, and it keeps on keeping on and. Every day I come in, and today it's down a little bit. And I'm like, yeah, so what? Okay. I'm not obsessed with that stock. I'm not trying to get in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out, make myself crazy, chase my own tail like somebody else said earlier. What I'm doing is I'm like, okay, you're doing good, little fella. Let me just leave you alone. I'm going to let you keep on doing what you're doing. And then I look at 2,000 other charts and say, where's my next little fella? Where's my next little buddy? Where's my little kitty that's going to turn into a tiger? Okay, I'm kitty hunting. Better be careful with that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's no perfect. Yeah, and I agree, Jonathan. But if that fits your personality better, then then that's what you should do. And the other, but if you could come over to the dark side, to my side of trading, then you're going to have to kind of close your eyes, let those things happen, be willing to take that drawdown, okay, and live with it. Um, I have a lot of day traders turn swing to intermediate term traders. At least they think they are. And those old habits die really hard, and it's very hard for them to not watch every zig and zag. All right, let me wipe, let me uh, finish up the short thing. Uh, the good thing is with shorts is they do slide faster than they glide, so you'll make money pretty quick when it does come. And and, and this uh, Gilead today is a wonderful example. So Gilead is down uh, sixty six fifty. So let's punch that in, and today's dealt on that. Yeah, so you made a pretty big, let's see, with the 444. So you can see that this number, the, the delta, got pretty big just on that one trade. So when they do crack, a lot of times they'll crack really fast. Okay, so that's an advantage. Uh, disadvantage is they slide faster than they glide. So sometimes it's tough to get on board. The other thing that's frustrating is it's like they trigger all at once. If you go in... And if you're on the service, you can do this because I don't I don't put the new services out there. I let I let them get old before I stick them out. About a quarter or two old. But if you look at the recent trades, and if you look at the recent recommendations, and if you look at the recent Landry list, you'll see that we had a day we had like ten shorts, and then the following day they all trigger. It's like really hard to take all ten of those shorts. Whereas on the long side, eh, you got ten stocks you're looking at. One will trigger, and then a few days later another will trigger, and a few days later. Eh, they don't look so good. So you end up long two out of ten stops. On the short side, you get ten good-looking setups. The market tanks. All of a sudden, all ten setups trigger at once. You obviously can't take all setups. And it's it, the other thing, too, is if the, because you want to be careful because before you know it, you're going to be overloaded on the short side. And what's going to happen, the overall market's going to go right back up. And then you're going to be hosed. So it's a little tougher uh, to do. And like I said, doing questionable conditions, it's darned if you do and darned if you don't. The market begins to roll over. If you don't hurry up and short a whole bunch of stuff, what's going to happen? The market's going to leave, keep tanking without you, okay? But if you do hurry up and short a whole bunch of stuff, what happens? It turns into just a little market correction, and the market goes right back up. I haven't solved for that. I don't know how to solve for that, okay? And then, again, the aforementioned retrace rallies are royal pain in the buttocks. And there is some logistics. Sometimes they're kind of hard to borrow, so anyway, shorts are painted, but but I think they're a necessary evil. It forces you to see both sides of the market, 
if you learn how to recognize short patterns, then you might be able to recognize when the bull market is coming to an end, okay? Um, it does help to mitigate damages a little bit when things turn. Okay, I haven't punched everything in today. I don't have it connected to live anymore, at least not in this spreadsheet. But so far, the day has been a positive day. It looks like a positive experience because those shorts are helping out. Now, I haven't punched everything in. There's some longs that are getting creamed, so maybe maybe that's not the case. But it's certainly not hurting to have uh, one stock down, a bucket change, and another stock down, four bucks that was short. Uh, now, if you do get into a longer-term bear market like 2008, unless you want to sit in your hands, the only way you're going to make money is to short, okay? Keep in mind, and there's been a lot of talk about this, I think too many people have become dependent upon the Fed to keep the, to keep the rally going, to feed the flames, to pour fuel on the fire. Every time this market is corrected, what's happened? It's going straight back up, correction, straight back up, correction, straight back up, Okay. One of these times is going to end badly. Could this be the time? I don't know, but I'm going to keep watching for signals, as I always do. And if things start looking a little iffy like they are now, I'm going to start putting some shorts on. Okay? What's the worst could happen? I get stopped out, and I go back to making money on the long side, and we get another one of these crazy cycles where the market just keeps going higher. So what? Okay? All right, I've gone way too long. Random thoughts, pretty much the same. One day at a time, guys. Let's not try to figure it all out right away. Much easier to predict individual stocks than it is to predict the stock market. So don't go crazy bearish just because the markets look a little iffy. Do fire off a short or two when you see them begin to unfold and do pay attention. So let's hop into the overall market. Let's talk about that real quick. And then let's, well, in fact, if you want to start asking about individual stocks, we can start that now, too. But let's look at the market first. Let's take a look at the P's. Now, the P's have been hanging in there on a relative basis and on an absolute basis, too. They made all-time highs a little while ago, but the inter internally the market had been deteriorating. And that's why I spend so much time talking about looking under the hood when it comes to trading or, or analyzing the markets, at least. And before you make trades, I should say, because if all you did was look at the overall market and say, well, the P's are at all-time highs, I better be buying stocks. Well, you'd be a hurting pup right now. And notice that we did break out, but came right back into the base. It found support right at the bottom of its base, okay? And like I said in the column this morning, if this market is going to roll over, what's it going to do first? Well, it's going to rally up big time. Make everybody think it's fine. Come on in. Water's great. Okay. And then what's going to happen? Bam. Sells off. Okay. I didn't know it would get creamed today, but I had a feeling that it was going to fake us out just because everything was looking a little dubious in here. Speaking of dubious, take a look at the NASQAQ. Okay. We had the mother ball down days on Friday, and then we bounce up a little bit. But notice how anemic that bounce is. And, you know, the, the great trick. Great and mighty trick. When in doubt, let's just connect the dots here. When in doubt, take the chart out. Oops, take the chart out. There we go. So you got thrust, a big retrace, thrust, and a retrace, okay? It's not a perfect pattern, but trust me, in the indices, you're never going to get a perfect pattern. So to me, this just looks like a retrace, especially since we only recapped about – Oh, I'm just eyeballing a little bit more than a third and certainly less than half of Friday's slide, okay? And then we're getting a resumption of the trend now. 80 points, 90 points down in NASDAQ. That's that's a big down move, okay? So NASDAQ looks like it's in a little trouble, a little bit more trouble than the P's. Um, you could see this multiple peaks in here. And then just for S&Gs, let's throw the moving averages in. And lo and behold, we have a bow tie down a little sloppy but it's a bow tie we got a crossover here okay so that's looking a little bit ugly I wonder if a two-day chart or a three-day chart would look a little better yeah a little bit cleaner on a two-day chart you can see in a two-day chart it kind of takes some of the noise out and you can see that the moving averages are coming together beginning to look a little ominous in here 
Okay, I don't use the MACD, but uh, I I probably wouldn't argue with that. SP and MACD show divergency. I would I would guess they do. Okay, but I look at 2,000 stocks. I look at the Nasdaq. I look at the Russell. I look at 300 sectors. I look at a handful of ETFs, and that all tells me that there's some deterioration out there, and that's why I've been kind of cautious. Okay. Um, a lot of these areas that recently tried to make new highs came right back in. Defense, that's a good example of that, or aerospace defense, I should say. Uh, take a look at, um, like, computer hardware, tried to make a new high, came right back in. Software, got to have software to go with my hardware, right? Right there, Okay. Pretty serious slide, pretty serious slide, pullback. Biotech, same sort of action. Okay. Slide, pullback, slide, pullback, slide. Same thing for drugs. Okay. Health services, another area broke out, brand new highs. Hey, the water's fine. Bam, came right back in. Okay. Manufacturing, remains below multiple peaks. Okay. Try to peak out. Manufacturing, consuming on durables, retail. The list goes on and on of all these areas. Leisure, okay, another area. Look at that, okay. Never did get past this prior little peak in here. Retail, great example of the multiple peaks. So far, beginning to roll over in here. Internet, back to the areas that are in a serious slide, just kind of pulling back. So what looks good out there? Energy. Energy looks pretty good, okay. Actually, making new highs today. What else looks good? Utilities, making new highs today, okay. What else? Foods, Making new highs. Tobacco, making new highs. What does that tell me? It tells me that these defensive areas, that money is flowing into them. Money is flowing into these defensive areas, and that tells me that somebody knows something, and somebody is putting money in those areas. And, yeah, like um, Andrea said earlier, Andrea said earlier, uh, MACD convergence on the spiders. Okay, well, I'm not smart enough to use an oscillator. Well, as I like to say, I'm too smart to use an oscillator. I'd rather look at all these clues and say, wait a minute, I'm seeing some serious sector rotation going on, and all the money's rushing into these defensive stocks in here, and all the money is running away from technology. So, from where I sit, it's starting to look a little ominous. It's starting to look a little ugly in here. But, hey, check back often, as I often preach, day by day. Is NEM coming back up? I don't know. All right, let's open up for individual stocks. Now, see, here's a case where um, you're in a stock and you want to stay. Oh, NIM. Okay, sorry. No, I don't, it's just wide and loose. Uh, I don't see anything to do there. No. EC? Just draw an arrow and the NASDAQ. You guys are getting smart. Don't get too smart. and You won't need me anymore. Uh, problem with EC is it has a lot of overhead resistance. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, that will be a good trade if it rallied up to 46, but you don't want to limit your gains. Okay. Just draw an arrow and the NASDAQ. C-O-P-Q-X. Well, you got one arrow does this. I guess your long, long arrow is still going up, but... I don't know. To me, it looks like it's getting in trouble here. Let's let's uh, just for S and G, let's put the moving averages in here. That's a 200-day moving average, which is down around 39.50. Which, as I was telling my peeps the other night in the service, if it gets there, by the time it gets there, it's going to be a little bit close to this 4,000 level, which would be the prior little peak in here. So that would be your short-term goal on the Nasdaq. Be careful with goals, though, because they often get undershot or overshot. Is there a way to find out who is buying and how many units? Good luck. No, Dax, no. Don't don't worry about the why and the who because that will make you crazy because the problem with that is there might be somebody right behind them that you don't know about. Uh, so we were talking at one of the meetings, I think last year's meeting of the AAPTA. It's like um, there's these big execution systems out there, and it's like a 1,000 bid. Okay, You hit the bid, a 1,000 bid magically comes back up. There are systems that are executing millions of shares, 1,000 shares at a time to mask that, okay? Let's say you did know someone was buying. Well, how do you know somebody else is going to be selling? 
I had the good fortune of being able to go down to the floor on a New York Stock Exchange with Kevin Haggerty's son. Uh, spent a half a day with him down there, or maybe just a couple hours. It felt like a whole day because it was a lot of work. And, um, you know, they have like what they call the book. The book shows you what, you know, speed offers, what's being sold. And it was an, kept on a notebook electronically. And then the guy had a sticky note for like to sell a million shares. So it's like, so you're in there thinking, wow, look at all these bids on this stock. And then the guy's got a sticky note and he's going to, he's going to dump a million shares on the market. And it was on his book, but it wasn't on his book. Okay. <laughs> so those million shares went out. So how do you know there's not a million shares waiting to be dumped? And that was a good experience. I, I, It'd be great to spend a year down there, well, if there is still a floor. I don't even know if there's still a floor down there. But it'd be great to spend a year in a place like that to see all the fun and games that were played and then come back to reality and realize that people think, oh, well, I see these bids on the screen, so it must be good. No, not necessarily. How do you deal with Peter Ward mentioned Java, JVA, if you picked it? Oh, I don't know. I'm flattered. I follow you and G. Now he picks it. If not part of the plan, is that the answer? I don't know. I don't know. He's not helping my job, my JVA much. <laughs> um. Yeah, I don't. I don't know if. Um, I sent Peter a copy of my book. I don't know if he ever got it. So maybe he read it. I'm flattered if he did. That'd be great. How do you rate trading these days compared to the best of the worst times in your career? Uh, well, you know, I got to tell you, I'm pretty impressed with my performance in spite of the market. How's that? Uh, I'm a little nervous about this market, but shoot, I mean, you know, oh, man, I'm, I'm getting ready to have the mother of all jinx, you know. One losing trade out of all these trades, boy, <laughs> write that down, March What's today? April, not even, April 10th, <laughs> 2014. Dave points out how great things are, okay? Um, I, think it's, I think it's doing just fine. Um, it seems like markets are a little harder than they used to be. I mean, if you take a look at, like, the NASDAQ, you've had some pretty serious corrections, if you want to call them that, bonafide sell-offs, and then the markets come back. It's, it's, it's almost like the Fed has manipulated this thing. And, and, um, but by using wide stops and putting on some shorts and getting stopped out of shorts and then going back long, okay? You know, this kind of sucked back here, right? But then what do we do? Well, we get long again, okay? And 2013 was kind of a tough year uh, for a trend follower. You look at it, it looks great, but you had some pretty serious corrections in here that should have been shorted, but the buy and hold people were rewarded for their bad behavior. And sooner or later, they're going to get punished, okay, for that. And maybe now is the later. Okay, uh, what's the um, what's the old Smith song? How soon is now? Dave, the quack bounce was exactly 62% on Friday, Tuesday's move. Correction, the down, not the quack. That's possible. Sometimes those numbers show up. Um, I don't watch those numbers that closely. I do have one pattern that uses those numbers, but um, for the most part, I just eyeball it like a gatekeeper. I just eyeball it. I don't actually measure it. I mean, the Russell did a gatekeeper. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't measure this move. But I bet if you did, I call it a gatekeeper-ish, okay? Yeah, it's a little bit. It's, it's probably 786, yeah, almost perfectly, okay? But I don't actually, I don't measure those moves. I just kind of um, eyeball them, and only in obvious situations. BTU for Mr. Phil. Mr. Phil from across the pond. Oops. All right. Anybody know what a Brit what a BTU is? BTU is a British thermal unit. Uh, Phil, I don't see it. I don't. I don't see what you're looking at. Um, it's rallied off its lows, but it's wide and loose and all. I think there's some other energy related stocks you might be able to find that are doing better. AMSC. AMSC. Uh, and uh, what's wrong? Am I on the wrong charts? Why? What's going on here? No, uh, no, this is down at low levels. Uh, why would you want to trade that? In mid-March, if a buy of WRES 477 to stop, 
three six is a stop too wide. Well, let's take a look at it. W R E S. And you were at four seventy seven, somewhere in here. And your stop was at three sixty. Yeah, I mean that's a little wide, but that goes back to where would you be really, really wrong, okay? And you would be really, really wrong at 350 because you come all the way back to the base. At, at uh, 360 something, uh, 360, yeah, I mean, that's a little bit too extreme. So maybe somewhere in between, maybe somewhere like, like here, okay, or maybe a little higher, maybe four, would have been a little bit better stop for that. Uh, volatility not incredibly high, although fairly high. So, yeah, that seems a little bit on the extreme side in that one. But, I mean, you know, go to where you were obviously wrong and then work it work up from there. Okay. SMT, probably not set up, but wondering if you have thought it triggered as a setup a few days ago on a pullback. SMT. Um, I would not have – this would probably came up in my Landry list, and I would not have taken it because it just shot up over two days. The market's a little iffy, and then it came all the way back in to where it broke out from. So I would leave that alone. Okay, on a downside now, that would be a witch hat, and that would actually be a viable pattern. That's really the only pattern that I trade that's a little different on the short side than the long side. Okay. Do you think going long metals or reverse ETFs are good alternative to shorting stocks if you're bearish exposure? Uh, you got to be careful with inverse ETFs. Um, Unless the market gets at a pretty good trend, the problem with the metals is the metals aren't always don't always do what you want them to do. Okay, I mean we're long NG. It's up a penny today. It's not really helping us much, but we got long NG back when it was set up. Right now, gold is no longer set up as a new new setup, or it's no longer set up. So don't buy gold just because you think the stock market is going down. Buy gold because gold's going up, okay? Buy stocks because you think stocks are going up. Sell stocks because you think stocks are going down, okay? Don't try to do your little intermarket technical analysis, okay? Uh, study that. Study intermarket te technical analysis and just kind of file it away as experience. Uh, AU, too many days of the pullback? Yes. Also, take a look at your prior little peaks in here. It never did really clear this prior peak, okay? If you're long, stay long, okay? But it never did clear that prior peak decisively, and then it came all the way back in. And now it's too many days in the pullback if you still want to call it a pullback. So absolutely not. GM short, I know, but too thick. Well, sometimes the short side, I mean, take a look at that Gilead. That's a big stock. Uh, no, it's too, uh, there's no pattern here, okay? Uh, and there's no structure. You had too many days in this pullback, and, and you're right. It is too thick uh, in general. It's just way too thick to try to short, okay? CZZ, a bottom play. That's going to be what? Cousins? CZZ? A Cousin? Uh, it's not bad. It's not bad. It's not coming off of all-time lows. I'll give it a not bad. I hear you. It's it's made a first thrust. It's got a little bit of a uh, kind of a pullback knockout move. Let's check the bow ties. Lo and behold, it's a bow tie. I'm going to give that one a not bad. Yeah, I think it's possible. You know, notice how it undershot its prior low in here. When you get a, a, a double bottom, not enough. we're almost out of time, so not enough time to talk about it today. But like I often say, a double bottom rarely makes that W look. Usually it, it overshoots it or undershoots it. When it overshoots it, that's my favorite pattern. And I think um, – trying to think of what stock that did recently. Was it SPWR or one of those stocks that overshot it and then it made the mother of all bottoms? AKAO long. Yeah, that's going to be a speculative new issue, AKAO. And no, see, this is not a long because let's talk about pullbacks, okay? Uh, it pulled back more than its entire trend. So no, no. Do we have time for Nicholas? Where's old Nicholas? What would Nicholas say? No. 
Half his bow tied up and pulled back. No, Don? <laughs> Where is Don today? Have I beat him up enough? F. Okay. Yeah, this stock is just all over the place. I, you know, I hate it because of that. I mean, it's trended in the past, but that was then. This is now. And, you know, you don't take a bow tie at high levels. You take a bow tie down here at multi-year lows or all-time lows. You don't take them on the buy side at high levels. You take them on the short side at high levels, but not on the buy side. Gary wants to know about EXXI. That's going to be an energy stock, I believe. Uh, but no. Okay, look. Or should I say no? Okay. Here's a stock that's going down. It's all over the place. What are the energies doing? Okay. Let's take a look at the entire energy sector. What's it doing? Let's draw an arrow. We're making brand new multi-year highs today. Look at how clean the whole sector is. So if the sector looks like that, why would you trade a stock that looks like this, okay? Sideways, all over the place, generally work its way lower. So absolutely not. CDW? Uh, yeah. Ooh, look at that. I triggered today. Um, it did kind of pull back to its prior breakout. But I hear you came back in. See, I would have passed on it based on that, the fact that it pulled all the way back to its prior little breakout. But it looks okay longer term. Uh, it would have to rally up and pull back. But let's not forget that the market itself looks a little questionable. Easy EWZ is going to be an ETF, easy for me to say. Uh, I've been watching these foreign ETFs. I have to say I do like them. I do think there's something going on there. Uh, unfortunately, I'm wondering if our market does tank, will these foreign ETFs also tank? Uh, I'm going to give you an okay on that, on Brazil. Uh, just remember that I, I've been putting some of these in my momentum list just to, just to, for filler, uh, because well, plus they're, plus they're trending, you know, not really filler. Uh, I'm going to say that looks okay, but my concern is if we begin to tank, what's going to happen? Okay. If you do a lot of trade micromanagement, then it is difficult to be consistent day after day, week after week. Thank you. My work is done. Thank you. Thank you, Leon. Beautiful. And that's the problem. If, you, if you're trying to guess every zig and zag and be on get in, get out, get in and out, you're going to end up eventually chasing your own tail. We're also only wired, as I often preach, to make so many decisions. And that's why, uh, especially during the heat of battle, and that's why air traffic controllers go nuts, okay? People in other high-stress jobs can only stay in those jobs for a short period of time. Unless you're um, an aberration or an outlier, maybe, okay? Then for most people, you're only wired to make so many decisions and it becomes real difficult. I've known several day traders who have gone crazy, and, and, and I, I hate to say that. It pains me. It, it's, it's sad. It's very sad. Um, I know one guy fell off the face of the earth. I had no idea where he is now, okay? Uh, I know another, well, a couple other people just flat out disappeared too that I'm thinking of, and uh, so I, I think it, it can make you crazy, and, and I mean this in a serious way, and I'm not trying to be funny or anything here, but I think that if you're watching every zig and zag and you try to get everything right, eventually you literally might go crazy uh, doing that. So be very careful. Find something simple. Stick with it, uh, and not to be cliche, plan to trade and trade to plan. So I'm going to end on a high note, and, and Leon, I agree with you 100%. If you do a lot of trade micromanagement, then it's difficult to be consistent day after day, week after week. Absolutely. Nice job. All right, we're going to go ahead and wrap things up. We're about uh, 10 minutes over schedule, so we got to go uh, so we don't lose the recording on this. Thank you so much for being here. I'm humbled by your presence. Um, I, I have a blast doing these shows, as you can tell. Anything unanswered, DavidAlander.com. Everybody have a fantastic weekend if we don't talk again, and then I'll see you guys again and girls next week. Thank you so much.